Prestige heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner here, as always, with my friend and comrade Derek Davison, and we're very excited to welcome to the podcast. I almost said back, but he will be back one day. Uh, Michael G. Van. Michael is a professor of history at Cal State Sacramento, and also the author of The Great Hanoi Rat Hunt. Empire, Disease, and Modernity in French Colonial Vietnam. But we are not asking him to talk about Vietnam today, kids. No, we're asking him to talk about Indonesia. But Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm delighted. I've been a big fan of you guys for a while, so this is fun. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, why don't we just hop into it uh, and uh, tease everyone. There's breaking news, Michael has informed us, but we'll get to that in a minute. Could you tell us, I mean, for people who might not know, and I, I must admit, I am I am one of those people, what has been going on in Indonesia in recent years preceding this recent election? And then we'll go from there. What's been going on in Indonesia? <laughs> You're asking a historian, how far are you going to go back, right? I mean, um, a an, another podcast. What's, what's the deal with Indonesia? <laughs> what, what's the deal? <laughs> well, you know, see, the, when, the joke, the old joke is whenever you ask a historian a question, uh, you know, well, you could, it's more complicated and, and you really have to go back further is the answer yeah. to every question. No, but but to, to avoid all these cliches, I mean, Indonesia is a land of contrast. Um Okay. Um, <laughs> what, what's been going on is um, we're 25 years into Indonesia's uh, restored democracy. Um, Indonesia was one of the first countries to gain independence at the end of the colonial era. They uh, declared independence in 45 and secured it in 49 and was, along with India, one of the biggest, right? During the 1950s, Indonesia slid into a left-wing authoritarian rule under the very charismatic nationalist hero, uh, Sukarno. Uh, many Indonesians go by one name, another cliche that we need to, we need to address right there. And, and Sukarno um, is, a, is a populist leftward drift, very friendly with the Indonesian Communist Party, but not a communist himself, even though he had this curious ideology of NASACOM, nationalism, communism, and, um, and religion, Islam. So it's kind of going to square that triangle circle or whatever that is. And then um, as he became more and more friendly with the Indonesian Communist Party and alienated the Indonesian army, there was a, a coup. Um, Vince Bevins, you know, did the fantastic book on this, The Jakarta Method, um, coup, a, an attempted coup in 1965 that resulted in an army takeover led by Suharto, a massacre of, um, we don't know, half a million, a million one of the genocidaires bragged at one point three point something million, but that might have been bravado. Um, and that instituted 32 year, 32 year dictatorship of General Suharto until 1998. And then Suharto um, fell from power in 98 due to economic uh, issues and also sort of the, the end of that sort of political trajectory. And um, democracy was restored. And we're on about 25 years of reformasi. Uh, which is how Indonesians refer to this period. And we've just gone through a major election cycle, which um, has... Michael, many let me interrupt for a nervous. second. Yeah, yeah. What does it mean democracy is restored? Could you give us a sense of the Indonesian political system? Because I, I just don't know, and I would need to know to further understand yeah, sure. what you're going to say. Sure, sure. So there is a strong parliamentary democracy with a with a fairly... The executive is strongest. The, the president is the strongest. Um, there's a number of parties... Um, couple dozen parties, but really about two or three that matter. And um, many of these parties form coalitions for for the presidency. Um, and I was I was going to make a, um, a political tree for myself of the parties and the figures, but I realized that the tree was a banyan tree because the uh, many of these figures switch parties back and forth. And it really is an oligarchy of um, elites, many of them tied to the old Suharto era. Jokowi, the current and, and outgoing president, is probably one of the few that doesn't come from fairly wealthy uh, elite background. Um, but um, it's a, you know, it's a vibrant democracy with big rallies, like really big rallies. You know, definitely sort of the carnival of, of the election atmosphere. 
and politics takes over during the, the election cycle, both for national elections and for um, regional elections um, and uh, elections such as like the governorship of Jakarta, which is a big deal. So just a quick question. Um, yeah. How is this ruling elite formed? What is the major economic thing that they're doing? How Are they huge landowners? Are they owners of export import firms? What are they doing? Extractive industries. Um, that's, that's one of the main uh, extractive industries, um, um, particularly mining, but anything um, plantation wise, you know, previously sugar, but then palm oil and coal mining. Um, rare earths are huge connections to uh, the gold mines. I mean, the I think it's still the largest gold mine in the world is in Indonesian occupied New Guinea. And so there's a tremendous amount of wealth coming out of the country. Oh, and, and also, lest we forget, oil and gas. I mean, there's a huge amount of petroleum and natural gas um, underneath Indonesian waters. So all of these extractive industries um, generate an, a wealth for an elite in Jakarta that uh, they're like incredibly wealthy by any global measurement. You know, if you look at the, the amount of money that Suharto, the... Um, the president, come, come dictator, who ruled for 32 years, um, pulled out of Indonesia. He puts Mobutu Sese Seko and uh, Ferdinand Marcos to shame. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, it's he, he fleeced about 10 times as much money out of the country. So this is a potential. This is no. This is a extremely wealthy country with radical um, disparity in how the wealth is uh, distributed. So let's talk uh, about the run-up to the election. Maybe you could just say, what are the major issues that people were voting for? What has happened in Indonesia in recent years that made this election so important? Yeah, well, so there kind of weren't really any major issues of difference. Um, the three main parties were extremely similar with some slight variation. Um, the three candidates were Prabowo Subianto, who goes by Prabowo, uh, Anis uh, Baswedan, and who goes by Anis, and Ganjar uh, Pranowo, um, we'll, we'll call Ganjar. Um, and they're, they're actually really, really similar, and they've been in each other's parties multiple times. They kind of switch back and forth. Um, if we want to sort of tease them apart, Prabowo is directly tied to the old Suharto uh, dictatorship, which I'd like to talk a little bit more about because his, his connections run really deep there. Um, and is nationalist, uh, authoritarian streak, to put it mildly. Anis um, comes out of um, uh, a, a more moderate sort of politics in regards to democracy, not as authoritarian, but has been flirting with uh, Islamist politics and is very much tied to some recent um, uh, um, Islamist demonstrations in Jakarta, which, which we all shall mention. And then Ganjar uh, uh, Pranowo, was totally forgettable, like really sort of wallpaper. And he came from the party of um, the current president, Jokowi. And he was just promising more of the same. And a year ago, we all thought that Ganjar had this in, in, in the basket. Like, there was going to be no problem that Ganjar was going to win. Um, maybe Anis. But then Prabowo did this incredible come-from-behind um, election campaign. And um, that's had... That's just what's been blowing all the Indonesia watchers away for the past six months because Prabowo is so tied to some of the worst aspects of the Suharto era dictatorship. Um, he, um, he was a, a child during the 1965, 1966 violence. Uh, he was actually, his family was in exile because his dad was a prominent economist who broke with Sukarno. And so he was, he was raised in, in various places elsewhere in the world, very elite background. And, but he came back to Indonesia and joined the army right away as a, uh, as a 19 year old, uh, became an officer, uh, served in East Timor where, um, uh, by all accounts, he has quite a heroic, uh, battlefield record. However, if you know anything about the Indonesian occupation of East Timor, um, I think most would agree that it was a genocidal occupation that led to about the death of about a third of the population of East Timor. Um, and he was directly involved in that and running commando squads. He had a famous team of ninjas who would go out at night with black ski masks and terrorize the population. And he married into the Suharto family. He married Suharto's daughter. So he was uh, the dictator's son-in-law. 
And then in 1998, when the um, uh, the wheels were coming off the Suharto regime, the so-called New Order, um, he it's it's a lot of I'm going to put a lot of alleged in here because I want to go back to Indonesia in a couple months. Um, but um, he is allegedly responsible for the kidnapping, torture, and disappearance of several dozen democracy activists. Um, and um, he the situation was so bad that um, after Suharto's fall, the Indonesian army discharged him, dishonorably discharged him. And he hasn't worn a uniform until, well, just a couple weeks ago when um, he was actually, had his rank reinstated. So he was, he was there's an um, American ambassador who said, this guy was so bad that the Indonesian army couldn't deal with his human rights record. So he's, he's got these, incre- uh, these, all these ties to the Suharto uh, regime and um, he ran previously for president uh, several times, most notably in 2014 and 2019. And in 2014, he had outright fascist uh, campaign ads. Um, Google the uh, Prabowo um, 2014 campaign ad, and there's there's a guy, there's a rock star in an SS uniform singing his name. I mean, it, it's 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 over the top, right? And then in 2019, and just a quick question: yeah. Where does that fascination with the Nazis come from? Oh boy, um, <laughs> this 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 runs deep, and um, um, it uh, it's it's that strong man aesthetic, and you know even Sukarno, who's left of center and friendly with the communists, would uh, famously would say nice things about Hitler, making German people feel good about themselves. There's a um, there's a vignette in um, one of ben- Benedict Anderson's books where he talks about translating for Sukarno at a cocktail party in Jakarta. And the diplomats can't believe that Sukarno is praising Hitler in the early 1960s. But it's this strong man aesthetic. And then you throw a couple decades of dictatorship on that and um, and it runs deep. Um, I, uh, I love telling the story about um, when I was a professor in, in, in Jakarta in, in central Java. I was down at the in front of the Sultan's Palace, and there were a bunch of kiosks um, selling tourist stuff. And one kiosk was selling posters, and there was a poster of uh, the Beatles and Manchester United and John Lennon and Hitler and then Sukarno. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, there's a poster of John Lennon next to Hitler, and it, it's totally, totally disconnected from any historical knowledge. Most Indonesians. Um, don't know much about the uh, the history of the Shoah, the Holocaust, and that kind of fascist imagery is just just seems like a strong guy kind of thing. But so he he ran with that in 2014, and then in 2019, uh, he was sort of playing Islamist politics in the election and unleashed uh, street violence. He refused to accept the election. He kind of he did a January 6 before January 6 was cool, um, but he uh, unleashed street violence and. Um, one of the ways in which Jokowi, the president, tamed him is he led him into the government. Uh, this guy had been such a thorn in his side that he, you know, he did the Sopranos thing of keep your keep your keep your friends close and your enemies closer, right? And so he made him minister of defense in um, late 2019 or early early 2020 and brought him into the government. And then these these two had been really bitter enemies, like forced this alliance. And that's right, like, let's talk yeah. about that because it's not only did he bring bring his enemy into government? They wound up, he wound up basically supporting his candidacy for president this time around. Like, how did that happen? How did well, that come to be? Wound up supporting his candidacy by like literally giving him his son. <laughs> so so just to, you know, to, uh, keep the, uh, everybody is keeping score at home. The, the current president since um, uh, 2014 is uh, Jokowi, right? Uh, Jokowi, Jokowi and Prabowo ran against each other in 2014 and then again in 2019. After the 2019 election, Prabowo, uh, Prabowo was brought into the government. And then over the course of the administration, they've become steadily closer. And this is wild because during the first Jokowi administration, there was talk in the, um, in the administration about bringing Prabowo up on charges for past human rights abuses. All that gets forgotten in uh, in the second administration, and um, by the end of it, they become political allies. And pro- when Prabowo ran this year, he was running against Jokowi's own party, 
So he's running against Jokowi's own party. But Jokowi gave him his son, um, um, Gibran, as a running mate, as a vice president. And um, it's even trickier because Jokowi was considering running for a third term, which you can't do by the Indonesian constitution. But he floated the idea of that and actually actually got pushed back. And that was that was a bit of a relief. But he kept kept floating that idea. So the way for him to extend his influence was forge this alliance with Prabowo, and then his son um, runs as his VP. And this is probably what tipped the scale for Prabowo, because Jokowi is incredibly popular. And um, Jokowi has been delivering the goods in terms of economic growth. I, you, know, you asked what the differences were in, amongst the candidates in this election. Not much, because it was really a status quo election. Most Indonesians wanted things to keep moving in a steadily better economic trajectory, which they have been. Um, the problem, the problem with giving uh, Jokowi giving him uh, his son to run as his vice president is the uh, the kid is like the ultimate nepo baby. Um, he was thirty six years old. The constitution says you have to be forty years old to run for president or vice president. So there's a there's a there's a crisis there. So it goes to the constitutional court, right? The constitutional court rules that. Jokowi's son, because he had been elected to be governor of a city, it was actually the city that Jokowi had previously been governor of, so he got, he got his dad's old job, right? The constitutional court says, well, he, you know, he's done administrative service, executive service, so that will count. You know who was on that court? Jokowi's brother-in-law. <laughs> this kid's uncle. And seems perfectly fine. Seems I, I don't totally see what fine. The issue totally is, fine. Yeah. But you know, the, um, the ruling held. But then um, the brother-in-law slash uncle gets kicked off the court. Um, and this, you know, this is this is the top court. This is the constitutional court. So by Jokowi giving his blessing to Prabowo, who again for a decade has been his his political nemesis, and giving him his son, this really won over. Uh, the youth vote, and I think it was the winning over of the youth vote that was really essential for the um, for the election, and the the tone of the campaign ads this time couldn't be more different than a decade ago. A decade ago, they had the heavy metal soundtrack with this fascist imagery, and um, Prabowo would literally ride into huge rallies on a horse, uh, you know, literally the strong man on a horse coming in. This time, they reinvented him as this cute, cuddly grandpa. And they're calling him by the Indonesian slang term, gamoy, which is like, so, so cute. You just want to, you just want to pinch his little cheeks, right? And I mean, whose really, grandpa hasn't committed some human rights violations <laughs> in the past in a systematic way? It's, well, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 both of my grandparents, but that's another story. <laughs> Fortunately, we've broken with that tradition. But uh, the, the the videos, the campaign videos, which were wildly successful, um, couldn't be more different. It's this cute AI-generated cartoon character of, of the older grandpa and then this younger kid. And um, uh, Prabowo would come out at these rallies and would dance and do these like kind of goofy little old man dances they were kind of like village folk dances. Um, and it, yeah, it's adorable. And he had, for years, for decades, he has this reputation of being short-tempered and fiery and, and unable to take criticism. And there was this complete reinvention. How sincere this new version of Prabowo is, who knows? Vast majority of people are, are really skeptical about this. But again, it's this incredible reinvention of this guy. Um, the, the voting stats I've seen is that older voters did not vote for him. They remember uh, the new order and they did not want to see a return to that. But he really won over the younger base and got almost 60% because the, the February 14th election was a three-way election. Um, and if, uh, what is it, if you don't get 51% of the vote, it would go into runoff at the top two candidates. And Prabowo got 58% uh, out of a, th a three-way election, which is, um, you know, <laughs> that's a political mandate. And then the, the breaking news that uh, just an hour yes. before um, we got online is that um, the election has been ratified, that uh, it's certified or whatever, whatever the term is. So 
you know, he was the presumptive um, president and it's now official. He is, is going to be the new president of Indonesia and get sworn in in October. And um, it's, it's wild. It's been a wild ride. Where do things stand now in terms of challenges? I know that Anis and, and Ganjar have both uh, said they intend to challenge the the, the victory in, in court. I'm not sure on what basis. It seems like this result was uh, more or less consistent with most of the polling in the last leg of the election, which, you know, polling, say what you want, I guess. But there does seem to be a, a, a like it doesn't didn't seem to be an anomalous outcome to me uh, that, that he got, you know, 58 percent of the vote or whatever he got. Um, so what what's the claim? What are the claims that they're making as they kind of formulate these these court challenges? And and then um, maybe you could also talk about this effort to potentially uh, do a parliament a parliamentary investigation as well. Yeah, yeah, no, a good question. Um, I mean, the the biggest thing is um, they they cheated by um, putting someone who was below the minimum age on the ticket, and then had uh, the nepotism of having uh, the the kid's uncle decide this. Right, um, that that's huge. What is clear is that on election day, it was a pretty darn free and fair election. I mean, there's really robust systems of uh, poll place. Um, observation and so forth. I've got some friends who are actually doing that work. And one of the guys was, uh, who's, who's no, no, no fan of, of Pro Bobo was saying, uh, telling me that, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be impossible to stuff a ballot box, um, from, from what he saw in, uh, in a couple, uh, a couple voting districts. There's just so many different observers. Um, not, not to say that you get in some outlying areas, something like that could have happened, but that seems very unlikely because there's a pretty robust network of, of observers. But what, so election day was probably okay, but the lead up to election day, there's numerous reports of all sorts of malfeasance. And um, is it Alan Nairn? Who's, who's always on democracy now? Is it Alan Nairn or Bob Nairn? I always mix them up. One's the famous Marxist theorist, and the other one's the journalist. I, I only listen to right. American right. Prestige, so I have no okay, idea. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I don't but, well, I listen yeah, to there are no other. Uh, That's right. But, um, uh, you know, he writes for The Intercept. And um, what, he, what he's been really good at reporting is the amount of influence that um, the Chicoi administration was throwing at people before the election, in the months leading up to the election. And this is um, all sorts of things like... Um, army or police visiting um, scholars at their university offices and saying, hey, mate, why don't you tone it down about uh, talking about this uh, issue with the vice presidential candidate to reports of uh, local officials threatening to withhold subsidized um, cooking oil and rice, which many poor Indonesians um, really depend on, and all sorts of uh, local pressures to um, let uh, villages and kampungs sort of like, um, uh, not slums, but like very, very, very populated lower class sections of the city, let then the district leaders of the kampungs know that they need to deliver this voting district for, uh, for Prabowo. So there's all sorts of pressure there. But they, you know, the, most of the Big demonstrations and um, complaints are focused on the vice presidential candidate, um, and that really um, and 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 by all accounts, I mean I think I think that is what what gave Prabowo the the electoral edge there. What's the what's the recourse though? Like with the the court having you know given him the exception to the the law and allowed him to be on the ticket, and you would have to illegally to challenge. You'd have to go back to the same court with with the same nepotistic problem. Like, what is the the actual hope of a of a recourse I, I operating within the uh, the system? Yeah. Well, so we don't know, and that it, that that right there is a really open question. And um, we will note that that was a court of nine, and the um, the, uh, the brother in law has been pulled off the court. He can't sit on that case, um, okay. and he re he received a reprimand. So it, it's, it's not like. It's not like people aren't getting slapped on the wrist, but it's happening after the fact. And I, I think that the fix is in, and I think they're just going to push this through. And now the, the opposition is very interesting 
because the opposition is a lot of folks that uh, your listeners might ident- identify with, supporters of, you know, an, an actual democracy, um, a lot of academics. Um, you know, the university I used to work at, uh, UGM, um, they've uh, launched major demonstrations, a lot of anti-corruption groups, a lot of um, sort of the more progressive aspects of civil society. But also, um, Islamist politics is, um, is playing a role here. And because um, Anis was the one who came in second, um, Ganjar was like a, a far distant third, um, many people feel that like, many supporters of Anis feel like they were really cheated in this process. And part of his larger coalition are groups that push for a much stronger Islamist presence in Indonesia. Um, uh, he's tied to the, uh, the 212 action, uh, movement, which was a series of demonstrations in 2016 and 2017 against Ahok, who was a Chinese politician, Christian Chinese politician who was, um, uh, they, they fabricated a video saying that he had offended Islam. And this was a huge mobilization and, um, uh, really brought, uh, Anis to national political prominence. So you have this this coalition of both more progressive elements of society and Islamist politics um, going after uh, Prabowo. I'm not sure that those two groups will find a common ground, but that's the, 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 these are some of the big questions right now, like what's going to happen. I, I, I personally think that this is just going to get steamrolled and pushed on through. Um, and he can point to the, the 58% of the vote. Um, and again, and what was... On election day, a pretty clear election. American Prestige is brought to you in partnership with The Nation magazine. Please consider becoming a subscriber at AmericanPrestigePod.com forward slash subscribe. As a subscriber, you'll get access to dozens of exclusive bonus episodes, including breaking news specials, deep dives into regional histories, analysis of movies and video games, and much more. And if you subscribe at the founder's level, you'll be able to claim a year digital subscription to The Nation. Thank you for listening. And now, back to the show. What is the lay of the land in the parliament after this election? What kind of support does Prabowo have? And if there is an investigation that's done through the legislative process rather than through the the legal process, is there any path there to, you know, to something that could really threaten Prabowo's victory? I I don't think so. Um, I'll admit that I haven't paid as much attention to the legislature, but I don't think so. I think we because of the uh, the coalition building between um, the parties that uh, got behind Prabowo, that I think they'll be able to push that through. Um, and and you know Prabowo is in many ways riding on Jokowi's coattails here. Um, and Jokowi remains tremendously popular, and Jokowi's been very strong in the, um, in um, his, his party's been very strong in Parliament. We, uh, we all, also we should note that. During Jokowi's second administration, there's been a steady series of reforms that he's pushed through that have increased the power of the presidency um, at the expense of parliament and made it more difficult to criticize the president and all, all sorts of um, ways in which um, uh, the the government can respond um, to human uh you know, human rights activists or labor activists and so forth and say, well, you're criticizing the government, you're criticizing the presidency. Um, turning that on other members of the elite, other members of parliament, I'm not quite so sure how that will work out. But um, I don't think that there's enough support in parliament to undo this. I, I could be proven wrong on that one. I could be proven wrong on that one. Again, I'm a historian, right? I look backwards. I don't look forwards. Well, let's, let's assume that you know, all of this fizzles out. It's, you know, brushed under the rug, as you've, you said, or, or, you know, just kind of rubber stamped. What do you, uh, expect or, you know, what, what concerns you about the possibility of a Prabowo candidacy? Is he going to go, you know, full fascist here or, uh, will the fact that he has, he does depend to some degree now on, on Jokowi, who's, who's this kind of, you know, consummate 
Barack Obama liberal type uh, type of guy with his son in the the position of uh, presumably heir apparent now. Um, does that will that moderate Prabowo's politics? And and again, I guess you know the legislature would would play some role here, not not a ton, but but maybe some uh, role. Yeah, I I think that again, that's another big question: is is this just so? Is this the making of a Jokowi political dynasty, or is this going to be Prabowo seizing power for himself? Um, what what is Jokowi's influence on Prabowo's cabinet going to be? Uh, one thing I'll note is that the Prabowo of 2024 is not the Prabowo of 2014 or 2019, just in terms of his um, his health and his energy. Uh, he's now 72. Um, he's walking with a bit of a limp. He is, he is looking more gimoy. He's looking more cuddly. Um, he's not looking as fiery. Was this, you know, was this really a campaign facade or is this guy actually melon with age? Is he going to have the energy to fight for this? I, I think a decade ago, yeah, it would be, it, we'd be looking at a return towards some new order authoritarianism here. I'm, we're really not so sure. Um, and, um, I know through some, some of the folks that, um, I'm in touch with that there's been, there's already the horse trading going on behind the scenes and the, the, um, the various members of the oligarchs or uh, the oligarchy are getting um, uh, cabinet and um, ministerial ministerial positions. But he seems to be buying off um, the uh, or well buying off, but we're bringing in the Jokowi's Jokowi's circle in a, in a big way. Um, I think that as long as um, he can start to increase it. Uh, the amount of uh, action in extractive industries, particularly nickel mining for electric batteries and things like that, there'll be enough money and enough uh, uh, energy and uh, sort of economic energy to sort of dish out the goods um, and 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 push this through. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I, I, I guess I, you know, I really think he's got it, <laughs> and I, I don't. I don't see a, like an effective opposition to him. So maybe we could talk about uh, talk a little bit about what's ahead for Indonesia. Th- there are internal conflicts. Indonesia is obviously a a powerhouse in Southeast Asia. There's this plan to move the capital that just seems hugely disruptive environmentally, you know, socially, whatever. What what are some things that are you know that are likely to to be on Prabowo's plate, assuming that we do get some sort of politics as usual and there isn't this hard right turn back to the, uh, the bad old days that it's just sort of chugging along. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, yeah, let me just circle back. I don't, I don't think it's, there could be a hard right turn, but I think what we're going to see is this increase of the centralizing, um, tendency that started under, um, Jokowi's second administration. And that may, may be kicked up and things five years from now may look very different than they do right now. But along the same sort of trajectory, that things look different now than they did in 2019. Um, the, I think the two big issues would be capital, uh, moving the capital, and mining. Uh, Prabowo has economic ties to moving the capital, so he's committed to it. He's got various contracts, and is he, he, he's an incredibly, incredibly wealthy individual with all sorts of um, uh, various subholdings and in mining, in plantations, in construction, and so forth. So I think the building of new capital will generate enough goods to dish out uh, amongst the uh, amongst the elite. Um, and the capitals, the capitals move forward. Allegedly, they're go- they're going to um, officially uh, declare it, consecrate it, anoint it on August seventeenth this year, which um, is Indonesian Independence Day, Hari Merdeka. Uh, that's the plan. When when offices will actually get moved over there is unclear. Um, it's it's disruptive in that it will be moving the administration administrative aspects of the Indonesian government out of Jakarta, but it's also a tremendous boon for the construction industry and for uh, regional transportation, so low cost airlines and so forth. So this is this is in some ways like a great make work project for for Indonesia. Um, along with this is going to be, I think under Prabowo is going to be a steady increase in, um, 
the extractive industries, mining and plantations, which have, are, have just been devastating Indonesia. I mean, the, if you look at like the disappearance of rainforests, uh, particularly in Borneo, where the new capital is going, it's, it's just stunning over the past um, 15, 20, 30 years. Uh, this will be accelerated, palm oil, sugar. Um, um, and then, again, I, I think I mentioned nickel mining and other, other um, metals for, uh, for batteries. And this is one area where actually um, Proboa had some uh, economic specifics in the campaign. Most of the candidates in the campaign were really, really vague, just sort of continuing this overall economic growth. Whereas he was playing a bit of a, uh, of a nationalist card and, um, and, and, and quite shrewd saying that, look, all we're doing now is exporting things like nickel. What we need to start doing is playing a role in the processing, getting it up to the grade um, that it can be used in a battery. And then what we need to do is move forward and start manufacturing batteries here in Indonesia. And so anytime, you know, you start to, you're not, you go from just being uh, an exporter of raw materials to doing some of the value added work, you're doing a benefit for your economy. And this could lead to further economic growth. Um, I know he's been, uh, well, Jacoby has been flirting with Tesla for years now, trying to get Tesla to build a, build a, a factory in Indonesia. What Probo is really pushing for is Indonesian battery factories and ideally Indonesian owned battery factories that are then exporting finished batteries. Uh, we'll see. Um, wh one of the things I read a couple of weeks ago is that the next generation of batteries may be less dependent on the minerals that Indonesia is supplying them. So the, this could backfire for him. Um, but then again, you know, striking deals with Elon Musk has always been good for all sorts of people, right? I mean, Elon Musk is a listener, so uh, take what Michael's saying as seriously, Elon. <laughs> uh, Michael, let's let's turn now to the most important country in the world, and that is, of course, the United States. Has the United States reacted to any of this? Has uh, the United States' policy toward Indonesia or the region in general transformed? Maybe you could give listeners some context for that. Yeah, no, the relations with the United States have been fairly uh, consistent. They're, not, they're nowhere near as close as they were under Suharto, where... Um, Mega close, uh, yeah. That, that's yeah. the period that I know as a historian the best, and it was right. so close. But it seems to be less so these days. You hear about it less from policymakers. It's well, not as covered in the news any longer, even though it's a gigantic country. And of course, during the war on terror, gigantic Muslim country that you very, very rarely hear about, which always struck me as somewhat odd. Yeah, well, I mean, I, it's where, where you look for your news sources. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm an Indonesia watcher and, um, you know, know people who were around uh, a couple of the uh, the attacks in uh, in in Bali and Jakarta. So yeah, that was that was on my radar screen. And the um, the Indonesian state um, in the in the aughts really swung into action with its paramilitary force um, against against terrorism. The densest 88 was like pretty pretty wild um i uh just as a digression i um i did i was a fulbright scholar in uh, gajamada in 2012 2013 and i was teaching a class on american imperialism and i showed i showed my students zero dark 30 and i thought it'd be this provocative you know look at the empire and a, a moment for critique and my students were like yeah yeah that, right on they <laughs> They really got those guys. They really showed them. <laughs> they got like, them. I mean, you can say what you will about the movie, you got but they them, got Joe. them. But the, um, yes, the, um, Indonesia has played, I think, a very quiet role in responding to um, some pretty nasty terrorist networks in the region. Jama Islamia, um, and there were um, uh, connections to uh, even to into the Moro land in the Philippines. And the um, Desus 88, this like this uh, anti-terrorist uh, commando force, has has been pretty, uh, shall we say, robust in that regard. But in terms of sort of general political alignment, um, there's been this big question: you know, is Indonesia going to move more into the Chinese orbit? I mean, that's where a good portion of their trade relations lie. That's what was one of the real anxieties of the Obama administration. Um, uh, I, I, but I think that I think that Indonesia wants to sort of balance and not not quite a return to the non-aligned movement, which Sukarno was a you know one of the founders of, right? But um, friendly towards the U.S., but um, very practical, and um, it's it's undeniable that Chinese money is is so central to the Indonesian economy. But he, but they got to be careful. 
because Chinese investment always runs the risk of inflaming local sinophobia, which is very, very intense. In any period of sort of civil strife, Chinese shops get burned right away. And under the Suharto dictatorship, Chinese language was banned. Um, Chinese holidays were banned. That's been, that's been rescinded, and now Chinese New Year is celebrated. Um, and um, Chinese neighborhoods and, and Chinese Indonesians are much more open about their ethnicity. But there's always this background level of anxiety. And we saw that flare up in um, 2016, 2017, when Anis ran for uh, governor of Jakarta against um, against Jokowi's uh, uh, political ally Ahok, who was ethnic Chinese. And there, in in the Islamist politics, there's always a lot of sinophobia, and um, that's directed both at local Indonesians of Chinese descent and Chinese foreign investment. So it's always always a tricky card there. Um, but I think that um, I think that Probowo will be very friendly to the United States, uh, possibly even friendlier than um, than Jokowi. He's uh, was um, trained at um, where, where's the school of the Americas? Is that Fort Benning? Uh, we should we should all know that one, right? <laughs> we should all know this off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, I but, believe but he, so. Let me let me check. Yeah, he, he's he's a graduate of all those. Um, uh, yep. Yep, 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 Fort Benning. Fort Benning yep. Yeah. Um, um, actually, I had a former student who was. Uh, uh, it's a, actually a Michael, the Western Hemisphere yeah. Institute for Security Cooperation today. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a historian. I go by the old school name. You know, I'm a, I'm, an, I'm an OG uh, Cold Warrior, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, he, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a graduate of these programs. Uh, he's fluent in English. He just gave a, a speech in English uh, yesterday that I was watching. Um, I think he'll be very friendly to the United States and, um, his party, his own, he, so he's one of the few that doesn't switch parties too much because he, he created his own party, Gerinda. And, um, um, you may not have caught this, but when, um, Trump was elected, but had not been inaugurated, um, one of the high ranking officials from Indonesia, who was a member of Gerinda went to Trump tower. And got his photo taken with them, and it was a it was a big scandal. But what it revealed was all sorts of ties between Prabowo's faction and um, Team Trump, and there's all sorts of uh, Trump Corporation investments, I think, in West Java, and and a few other places. So um, if the election goes the way it looked like it might go, uh, uh, when are we speaking? March, late mid March of uh, 2024. Uh, I think that um, Prabowo and Trump would be rather uh, simpatico. Just a couple of savvy businessmen, you know, doing <laughs> just getting things done, getting things get done. Things I think done. business yeah. leaders should be our political leaders. I think there's a direct correlation between being good at business <laughs> and being good at politics. Uh, and that is the podcast position. Um, so, Michael, what what final thoughts would you leave listeners with? What should they be paying attention to? Where should they look for news on Indonesia? All that good stuff. Um, look for news in Indonesia. Uh, well, you could look at what, every now, every couple months. I write something in Jacobin for them. Uh, on Indonesia. Um, um, I think the issues to really pay attention to are, well, I mean, what happens politically in these next six months? Um, although, again, I think he's going to steamroller that. But um, what what is going to happen in terms of will there be a further development of these extractive industries that are already doing so much damage to the Indonesian environment? Um, because, you know, maps are misleading, right? Mercator projection is very misleading. Indonesia is bigger than the continental United States. It is a gigantic swath of territory with um, a huge, whose rainforests play a huge role in, um, in the global environment. And the steady deforestation that we've seen uh, has been disastrous. Should that be increased, that's going to have an impact not just for Indonesia, but it's going to be, it's going to be a global impact. Um, that's, I think that's the main area of concern. Another area to look at is something that um, barely anybody talks about, and that's Papua, Indonesian-occupied um, Western New Guinea, um, and uh, the steady human rights abuses that are going on there. News trickles out bit by bit. Um, I can only imagine Prabowo is going to take a really hard line there. And we also might see things tick up again in Aceh. 
Um, Aceh was in a prolonged civil war that really didn't come to an end until uh, the tsunami disrupted everything. And um, a previous president negotiated an agreement after um, uh, after the 2004 tsunami, and that gave them some regional autonomy. But because um, Anis was so popular in Aceh, we may see some tensions flare up there again. Uh, I, I hope not, but um, I think those would be the areas uh, to pay attention to. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll definitely have you back again soon to talk more about Indonesia. Really appreciate it. That was a delight to be here. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.